Well, as I mentioned this morning and this evening, we're going to revisit the text we were looking at this morning, and we'll review what we've seen this morning and try to draw out uh, some of the other things that are in it. Uh, I did this morning read uh, John chapter 4, verses 1 through 42, the account of Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well of Samaria, and I mentioned all the different things that we can really draw on from that text. But we really want to focus on just a couple of verses Uh, The ones we were looking at this morning, let me read them for you now, verses 23 and 24, where Jesus says to the woman of Samaria, but an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So may the Lord again bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now this morning we were looking at the question the Samaritan woman asked Jesus and his response to her. Remember she was asking the question, where is it that we should worship? Where does God want us to worship him? Was it on Mount Gerizim, which is where the Samaritans had built their, basically their religious system Remember, it was kind of a hybrid between the Jewish religion and some pagan religion. Uh, Or should it be on Mount Zion, where Jerusalem is, as the Jews believed? Now, Jesus, as he uh, often does, simply cut to the quick by answering the more important question she didn't ask, although still answering the question that she did ask. Jerusalem was the right place. God made his covenant with the Jews. The promises were theirs, as well as the true worship that he had committed to them. But Jesus points out to her, the time was coming, and he says now was, when the place of worship would really no longer matter. And the method uh, which the Lord had entrusted to the Jews, the whole ceremonial system itself, was about to be changed. The reason being that Jesus was about to lay down his life. He was going to fulfill the Old Testament types and shadows, which were centered primarily at that time in the ceremonial system and the sacrifices and the priesthood and all the various rituals that were going on there. And when he fulfilled these, he would strip away those physical aspects of worship leaving worship that is more spiritual in nature. Remember, I pointed out this morning, I mean, just look around you, you know. This is not very ornate. And even if we didn't have this building, we could still worship the Lord, right? If they didn't have the temple, they couldn't. It was tied to these physical things. But the physical things, again, are being removed, leaving that which was most important. And that is the spiritual part of the worship. Uh, The Lord says in verse 24, of our text, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, what we saw this morning is essentially this, that we are to worship God, which means more than just gathering together on Sundays or on Wednesdays or in our prayer closets during the week. Um, We are to worship God all the time. We are to devote ourselves to him, be devoted to him and to the service that he calls us to give to him. Devotion, service. This is just a part of it, this isn't the whole. The whole is our lives. We are to show this worship, Jesus said, to the Father, to God, who is of course Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We saw that uh, Jesus will use the, the name Father to refer to the whole Godhead. So he means, of course, the triune God. And of course, we know from the rest of Scripture that we are also to worship him because he is the son of God in our nature and when Jesus was worshiped by those who recognized who he was he did not turn them away he did not tell them to stop but rather he received it that we are to do this we are to worship him show him this devotion to to God at all times and in all places and really in every decision we make we should have regard to God's will We should do this because of who he is. I mean, he is the most perfect, beautiful, worthy being that exists, and he is infinitely so. We should do it because of what he has done. Uh, He is the one who has made us. 
He's the one who made all things. He's the one who takes care of us, as we're reminded in the catechism. But he is also the one who, out of his infinite love and at great personal cost to himself, gave us his son that we might be redeemed. Remember, the Father loved us and gave what was most precious to him, not second most precious, but most precious. The Son loved us and gave himself for us, his life. And the Spirit loves us and lives in us and he guides us and and, uh, teaches us and works in us to make us like Jesus. Again, how can you put a value on, on this love of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Now, again, that's what worship means. That's who we're supposed to worship, how we're supposed to worship, why we're supposed to worship. But we saw further that our worship is to be of a particular character. Jesus says it is to be in spirit and in truth. I've already sort of touched on this in that we should not try to serve the Lord through physical things like the superstitious people of the world who make idols out of stone, out of wood, out of uh, metal, and then they offer physical objects to those things to show their devotion. That's not how we worship God. God is spirit, and what he wants from us is spiritual. He wants spiritual sacrifices, the sacrifices of praise and of prayer and obedience to his commands. And Jesus said we are to worship him in truth, which means not just according to his word, that, though that is important, but that we not simply go through the motions of worship, acting like we love him, but doing what he calls us to do from the heart in sincerity because we love him. I think maybe one way to illustrate the difference between these two things would be like that between a, an arranged marriage and a marriage for love. Now, arranged marriages are not things we're terribly common or familiar with in our culture, but we do know they exist, certainly existed in the Bible, and certainly they can work. But we need to understand that there's a difference between a marriage made for an alliance between two countries versus a marriage because of love. Now, in these relationships, both may go through the same motions and do exactly the same things, but they have different motives, one because they have to do it and the other because they want to do it. The Lord wants us to do it. He wants us to do what he calls us to do because that's what we want to do in sincerity from the heart and not simply because it's expected of us or we have to do it, though we recognize sometimes that may be all the motive we have. We still need to do it even if we don't feel like doing it. The Lord wants us to take him as our husband with all of our hearts and to do our best to serve him from the heart. Now this evening, let's consider that this is the reason he sent Jesus into the world, that this is what he was seeking when he did this, that he might make us into this kind of worshiper. And again, that's what Jesus is really talking about in verse 23 to the Samaritan woman where he says, but an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. Now we're going to try to probe a little bit more into just what Jesus is talking about here. But we do need, I think, just for a moment to back up and see what it is that is really being described here or who it is that is being described when we're talking about the kind of worshiper that the Lord is seeking. Because who is this kind of worshiper but the Lord Jesus Christ? As a matter of fact, he's the only one who has really ever done this in the way that it needs to be done. He was one who was devoted to his Father. He served his Father. As in the way we've seen, at all times and in all places. Whenever Jesus was faced with any situation, with any decision at all, he always had regard for what his father said. He thought about it and knew what he needed to do, and he did it. He carried it out with all of his heart because he loved the Father. Jesus is going to say a bit later in this chapter, again, a passage that 
I think is, is very interesting. It shows us the level of commitment that Jesus had, which, of course, is perfect. When the disciples come from Sychar with the food that they went into the city to get, which left Jesus alone at the well so he could talk to the woman, when they return with the food, he says this to them in chapter 4, verse 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Uh, I should probably pause just for a moment and say that is what our attitude should be, although it's, we perhaps don't always find that to be the case. God's will is more important. Now, this is the heart of our Lord. This, this was his soul. He was devoted to his Father. Now, I think in the Old Testament, the Lord, and actually it's by the Spirit of the Lord, by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, describes for us perhaps a little bit more clearly what his son was going to be like. And I think it kind of just embellishes what we've just read. And this is what we read in Isaiah the prophet, chapter 50, verses 4 through 7. And it is describing Jesus. I think you'll, you'll see that. If you don't see it right away, you'll see it certainly by the end. He says, The Lord God has given me the tongue of disciples, that I may know how to sustain the weary one with a word. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. For the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I am not disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. This is really the expression of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what was going on in his, in his heart, in his ministry. And as he was approaching the crucifixion. Remember, we, we saw this, I think it was on Wednesday evening, momentary light affliction. The idea that Jesus, as he was going to the cross, he was despising the shame, not that he looked at it and just despised it, but it meant he just, he considered it nothing compared to what it was he was actually going to receive on this path. And he took this path willingly so that he might receive this glory, this this exaltation. But again, notice his heart. He was not willing in any way to turn away from his father's will for him, but to carry it out to the end, even though it, it meant great personal cost to him. Now, this is worship. I mean, this is what it means to worship the Lord, to do whatever the Lord calls us to do, to be completely devoted to him in every circumstance. We see it in Jesus. And this is our model. Jesus is the perfect paradigm. He's the perfect example. He's the one who not only shows us what the Father is like, but he's also the one who shows us the kind of life that is pleasing to him. The author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 1.3 that Jesus is the radiance of his glory, that is God's glory, and the exact representation of his nature John tells us he came into the world in order to explain the Father to us. But Jesus says of himself and of his commitment to the Father in John 8, 29, And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Okay, this is the kind of worship that the Lord is seeking. Now, Jesus is what we are supposed to to be. Now again, not that we are supposed to be like Jesus in his ministry and to do the things that he did in his ministry, but we are to be like him in the sense that if Jesus were actually to be living in our place, that we would be doing what he would be doing in our place because he would always do the things that are pleasing to the Father, and that is true worship. So it shouldn't surprise us that his goal, that is the Father's goal in sending him into the world, and Jesus' goal in actually coming into this world was that we should be like him. I mean, that is the purpose of salvation. Paul writes in Romans 8, 29, for those whom he foreknew, talking about God the Father and talking about his foreloving us, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son 
so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Again, the idea here is that God loved us before the foundation of the world, before he had created anything, before we existed. And he chose us for a particular purpose, and that purpose was that we might become like Jesus. And that doesn't mean just in heaven, that also means on earth. So that Jesus would be the first born. And that doesn't mean that he would be just the first among many in the sense that he was the first one because there were people who were saved long before Jesus came on the basis of what Jesus actually did. But firstborn refers to preeminence. Even as one of the Psalms talks about David, I've made David my firstborn. Even though he was the youngest of Jesse's sons, he was given the privilege or the honor of firstborn, the preeminence among his brothers because he was chosen as king. Now, Jesus would have that preeminence being God, of course, but here it's just saying that we are going to be like him so that he might have preeminence among many who bear his image, who are like him. And now that Jesus has come, by his grace, we can be like him. And Jesus says in verse 23, but an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. Uh, it was now, uh, the hour was coming, but now is because Jesus was then present and he was the one who was going to bring this about. Now, Jesus here, as we saw this morning, is not saying that there weren't already people in the Old Covenant who were his worshipers, who were like this, becoming like Jesus purely by his grace on the basis of what he was about to do. But it might not have been as clear to them in the Old Testament that, that what, what Jesus was actually saying was the most important element of worship was really what God wanted. I think many of them thought, as we know, that what God really wanted was for them just simply to go through the motions of offering the sacrifices and burning the incense. And as long as they did all these things, all would be well. But that's not all that was needed. Jesus was going to strip away all that external stuff and what was really important was going to remain and that is the spiritual aspects of worship. But that would not have been possible except Jesus did the work that he was about to do. And that's why the hour was coming and now is. Because Jesus has come to, to gain the very thing that we needed for this to take place and that is the Spirit. Again, just a quick reminder, Jesus uh, came to obey the, the commandments of God in order to purchase, in a certain sense, to merit the Spirit. He died to cleanse us of our sins so that He could give us the Spirit and the Spirit would dwell in our hearts. He was raised from the dead and ascended into heaven and glorified that He might send the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, that's what he did when he was glorified. He poured his spirit out on the day of Pentecost, which was the evidence that he had been crowned king. He had been glorified, as he said he would. And now that the spirit has been sent, and now that we have the spirit, we are this kind of worshiper. Not to the same degree that Jesus was, because he was anointed with the spirit above measure, but we have the same devotion to the Father, to, to God, to Jesus. We have the same regard uh, to his rule, to his standard. We have the same desire Jesus had to respect God's rule at all times and in all places. And we have the same motive that Jesus had. We love the Lord and we want to please him. Uh, Jesus is going to say to the Jews in the next chapter, he's going to put this in different terms, in terms of a spiritual resurrection in John 5, 25. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. You see, now that Jesus was there and he was working through his Holy Spirit, the possibility of spiritual life was was there. And even as he raised those who heard him in those days, he has raised us from spiritual death to spiritual life because of what he has done, because of the work of his Holy Spirit. 
so that we may now worship God as Jesus worshiped him. And so this is what we are to do. Jesus is the example. Jesus came so we could do this. So this is what we are to do. We are to worship God the way that Jesus worshiped God. We are to live the kind of life that, that he lived. Uh, Paul actually commands us to do this. this, is what he's saying in Romans chapter 13, verse 14, where he says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Don't, don't put him on in the sense of pulling the wool over his eyes, you know, but put him on, put on his character, put on his likeness, become like him, and put off everything that's not like him. Worship God the way he worships God. This is his will for us. But as we've already seen in the new covenant, through the work that Jesus has done, he's actually given us the ability to do what he has commanded us to do. The Lord doesn't just, again, command us and say, this is what I want you to do, so pull up your bootstraps and get busy and do it on yourself, you know, by yourself and you're under your own steam. No, in the new covenant, God gives us the grace to do this and I think this is very well expressed through an ancient prayer that Augustine wrote, a very short one, where he, he writes this, Lord, command what you will and give what you command. You have the right to command, Lord, whatever it is you, whatever it is you desire, but I know that I can't do it, so if you want me to do this, you're going to have to give me the ability to do this. And so he says, command me, but give me this ability. So we have that ability through the Lord Jesus Christ, through his Spirit. Through his Spirit, this is also the kind of life that we're going to want to live. A life that is devoted to him. A life of service to him. That is all the time and in all places that is not only directed towards him, doing what is pleasing to him, but also what is good for all men. Remember, loving, worshiping God means not just showing our, our devotion to him, but his part of that devotion is how we are to treat other people. Love your neighbors yourself. And we will do this, as I said, we'll want to do this because it's in our hearts to do this. If we have his spirit, we have this ability and now that we do through the Lord Jesus Christ, this is what the Father is actually looking for in us. This is what he is seeking in us. This is what he wants. What this means, of course, is that we actually will to some degree. And again, the degree depends on how much we actually give ourselves to this because there is something we need to do. We need to yield to the Spirit. We need to walk in the Spirit. We need to use the means of grace and, and have a stronger influence of the Spirit in our hearts, we will devote ourselves to doing what the Lord calls us to do at all times, in all places, as an act of love and worship to Him, even as Jesus did, even as Jesus would do if He were living in our place. And here, you know, just a few examples, and I think they're fairly obvious ones. As I've said, it, it, we'll do this in, in every area. I, um, think, let's think about this. I mean, I've broadened worship beyond Sundays and Wednesdays. Actually, I haven't, but the Lord has, right? But let's not forget, this is a part of our worship. Let's not neglect this, okay? So we will worship the Lord, and we'll do it in a way that we know is pleasing to Him. It also means that in all of our relationships in life and all the things that, well, that, that we have to do, we will do it in a way that is honoring to the Lord. And so here's a few particular examples. It means... If you are a husband here this evening, that you will love your wife as Jesus calls you to love her. Paul writes in Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. It means that as husbands, you will try to understand the weaknesses of your wife and you will show her honor as a sister in the Lord. You'll care for her. Peter writes in 1 Peter 3, 7, you husbands in the same way live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker since she is a woman and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. This assumes, of course, that your wife is a believer. Um, otherwise, she's not a fellow heir of grace unless, of course, the Lord 
saves her. But notice again the love, the gentleness, the understanding. And I, I picked this example because as a husband, I know we all need to be encouraged in this way to love our wives. It means that if you are a wife, that you will honor your husband and submit to his headship in the Lord. And let me just simply say for those um, who, young ladies that aren't married here uh, this evening, uh, if this is what the Lord calls you to do, you better make sure that it's, you marry somebody that you'll be willing to do this with because the Lord does give headship to the husband, but not to tyrannize his wife, but rather to minister to her. But this is what Peter writes in 1 Peter 3, verses 1 through 4. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands so that, it even, if, that, excuse me, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word... They may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit which is precious in the sight of God. So, Wives, you want to worship God? This is how you do that in your marriage relationship. Husbands, you want to worship God? This is how you do it in your marriage relationship. This means that if you're a parent, that you'll love your children and you'll do all you can to point them to the Lord. Paul writes in Ephesians 6, 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And it means if you're a child and... And really, by a child, I mean, who here isn't a child, right? I mean, we, we are all children in a certain sense. We are all the children of parents. And I think that what is being said here applies not just to young children, but also to older children. Honor your parents. Paul writes in Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 3, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And this doesn't mean that, you know, after a certain age, you just say, well, mom, dad, you know, <laughs> see you later. I don't have to listen to you anymore. And, and because you are obedient for that first part of your life, that the Lord is going to bless you the rest of your life and give you a long life on the earth, we need to honor our parents all the way through, even in their old age, and take care of them. That's how we honor them. But listen to what they have to tell us if what they bring to us is the word of the Lord. Honor them. It means as members of the same body, that is, again, worshiping the Lord, that, that we'll do everything that we can to build up our brothers and sisters in love. Again, Peter writes in 1 Peter 3, verses 8 through 9, to sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Again, think, what would Jesus do, okay? If he were in any of these circumstances, he would do what is honoring to the Lord. That is what we're supposed to do. As citizens, we are to subject ourselves to the magistrates' lawful commandments, not when they try to overthrow God's commandments. As members of, body, of Christ's body, we need to respect the overseers that he puts in the congregations. As employers, we need to do our best to serve our, uh, or say as employees, to serve our employers. We will respect the Lord's wishes in everything, in every area, and do everything we can to please Him. And we will know that it's not enough simply to go through the motions. Remember, it's not enough. God wasn't pleased with the Jews just because they were worshiping in Jerusalem and just because they were doing the things He commanded them to do in their worship. They could do all of that and still not be pleasing to God. And again, there's a lot of things that we can do, as Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 13. You know, even give all of our possessions to the poor. Give our bodies to be burned as martyrs. But if it is not out of love for the Lord, if it's not done sincerely because we love Him, it means nothing to Him. So we will do what we do for the right reasons, with the right motives. We'll do it 
uh, from the heart. Now, again, this is the kind of person the Father is seeking, that he is looking for. He searches to and fro throughout the earth, the Scripture says, looking for the one whose heart is completely his. I don't know if you've thought about that passage lately, but I mean, wouldn't you like to be the person that his eyes actually light on? That person is mine, completely mine. Now again, we are his if we belong to the Lord and the Spirit of God is in us. He looks at us and he sees that, that our hearts belong to him, but obviously there are going to be differences and our desire in this regard when it comes to love for God is that we would be standing out. Not trying to stand above our our brothers and sisters, you know, that's not what we're trying to do, except by way of humbling ourselves and serving one another. When it comes to what God sees, that he would see love in our hearts, great love. So that's what he wants us to be, and that's what he has made us to be through the gospel. Now, lastly and quickly, let's not forget that he also wants to use us to seek other worshipers. I mean, how did he seek us? How did he find us? Well, he found one or two, perhaps, or more, of those who were already worshiping him, and he sent them to us to share the gospel with us, and that is how we were found. That's how Jesus found us through that work. But now that he's found us, he wants basically to do the same thing through us. Again, he wants us to do what he would do if he were here in our place. Well, what would he do? Well, he says in Luke 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's the main thing Jesus came to do. He did many other things as well, but that is certainly perhaps a good summary. Uh, he was concerned about the souls of others. He went out looking for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Uh, and he rejoiced and heaven rejoiced whenever he found one. And now our Lord tells us, as those who have been found and are a part of that body of worshipers that we are to do the same thing he did. Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. And he says through Peter, something perhaps that seems perhaps a little more scaled down that we can kind of get our, our hands around. Uh, he says in 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you were slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. I do think we need to be living openly as Christians so that people will ask us uh, what, what is that's different about us and if we, they should um, get upset with us say some nasty things about us, all the things they would have to say would be false. They would be put to shame because they're falsely accusing. You see any of that going on today in any circles? One party hates another party, so they slander them relentlessly. Well, that's what the wicked are going to do to us if we live as Jesus calls us to live. But when they slander us, we need to make sure that they can't level an accurate charge against us and make it stick. We need to be like Jesus, and we need to be ready to defend him, and we need to be ready to tell others about him. This is what the Lord is seeking from us as a part of this worship that he is seeking. So may the Lord give us grace to be this kind of person. He already has by his Holy Spirit, but may he give us greater grace and encouragement day by day. And again, as we sort of have, uh, again, reminded, as we're reminded that this is really what the Lord is seeking from us, may He help us to see it, maybe from a fresh perspective, a fresh angle that will maybe help us to pursue it a little bit more, uh, with a little bit more focus. Well, let's uh, bow for a moment of prayer and let's, uh, silent prayer, and let's ask the Lord to help us to do this.